Hello everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you here and I'm sure more will be joining as I speak. Do say hi and where you're joining us from in the chat. Remember to switch your chat options to all pan panelists and attendees if you'd like to share your comments with everyone. My name is Dinyar Godridge and I'm co-editor at New Internationalist magazine. I'm joining you from Rotterdam in the Netherlands today. Before we start, I should let you know that this webinar is being recorded. Now, the current edition of New Internationalist is focused on the subject of vaccine equality, as you'll see. The development of vaccines for COVID-19 happened at unprecedented speed, but it couldn't have come soon enough. This pandemic has killed over 3.3 million people across the world, and that's just the official tally with that number rising all the time. And its impacts have been truly devastating. Access to vaccines is one tool in the struggle against this virus. Now here in the Netherlands, I was able to have my first vaccine dose last Saturday. And in the UK, people in their thirties are now getting theirs. There is even talk of life beyond COVID-19 restrictions but this is far from the reality for everyone. A global pandemic needs to be tackled with global solutions and international solidarity. Despite the hard work of so many health workers, scientists and campaigners, some of the world's most powerful governments and companies have stood in the way of attempts to make the vaccine rollout more equal. In our May-June edition, we go into the topic of vaccine inequality from different angles, including how vaccines work, what to expect from them, the history of vaccines and the influence of the infamous Bill Gates. New Internationalist has been covering issues of social and environmental justice for nearly 50 years now. We go in depth into big topics, demystifying complexity, and exploring solutions. While the mainstream media can get caught up in nationalism and even bigotry, our outlook is firmly internationalist and focused on journalism as a public good. We operate as a cooperative and for the past four years, we have been co-owned by over 3,600 of our readers across 42 countries. We're currently welcoming new co-owners on board through a community share offer, and you'll see the details of that in our chat. Now, this event will be just over one hour long. It's not a lot of time for such an extensive topic, but if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we will try and answer some of them within the time. My colleague Husna Rizvi will be keeping an eye out for them. We're lucky to have two amazing panelists here with us. We have Heidi Chow joining us from London in the UK. Heidi is a senior campaigns and policy manager at Global Justice Now and leads their pharmaceutical campaign, which is fighting for access to medicines across the world. Heidi wrote the lead article in the current edition for, of New Internationalist, which is well worth reading. And then we have Sarojini Nadimpalli, who is joining us from Delhi, India, where the COVID-19 crisis is particularly harrowing. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarojini. Uh, Sarojini is a public health researcher and co-founder of SAMA, an organization that bridges the public health and women's movements, and which is part of the people's health movement. And they are joined by Amy Hall, my new internationalist co-editor colleague, who I will now hand you over to. Thank you, Dinya. I'm just going to move everyone around a bit. And welcome uh, Heidi and Sanjini onto the screen. Thank you. And yeah, thank you both for joining us today. Um, it's really great to have you here. So um, we're going to have like a bit of a conversation about vaccines um, we've got quite a lot of things that we want to talk about um, and we'll try and cover everything but um, do, do ask questions um, in the chat or in the Q&A box as Dinya said. So um, I'm going to start um, 
by just talking a bit about the global kind of situation. Um, so in March, the People's Vaccine Campaign estimated that since the start of the year in high income countries, on average, they'd been vaccinating citizens at a rate of one dose per second, whereas in many other countries, um, people had, have not even received a single dose yet. Um, Heidi, can you summarise a bit about why this, there is such an inequality in access to these vaccines? Yeah, th thank you, Amy. Thank you for inviting me to join the panel um, this evening. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we, like you said, we are facing a grotesque level of vaccine inequality. Um, we have seen countries in the global north, like the UK, like the US, like the EU, rushing ahead to secure vaccine doses for themselves in advance. They started this last year and they secured vaccine doses for themselves even before these vaccines were approved. Um, and the reason why they raced ahead to hoard these vaccines was because they knew that there would be a scarcity of doses. Um, and the reason why there's a scarcity of doses is because we, um, we have a system that is dominated by pharmaceutical monopolies. So this means that um, only Pfizer can make the Pfizer vaccine, only Moderna can make the Moderna vaccine. Um, and these monopolies um, are art essentially artificially restricting supply. So that's why we have a scarcity of doses. Um, and so we have essentially a combination of things happening. We've seen, so we've got this inadequate supply because of this artificial scarcity created by monopolies. Um, and then we've also seen this skewed distribution, which is driven by wealth essentially. So the wealthy countries went ahead to hoard those vaccines um, and the pharmaceutical industry were more than happy to sell to the highest bidders in advance. Um, and essentially we've got a situation where we have handed over all control over these publicly funded vaccines to private companies who now are able to control the price, the supply and distribution. Thank you, Heidi. Um, and um, Sarah Jini, um, I just wanted to talk a bit to you about the situation in, Orpha, which, oh my goodness, in India, which is really so awful, um, just the amount of cases and, and the oxygen crisis that we've been seeing um, in the news here. And we're really incredibly grateful that you could make it here today. And how much is this level of suffering that's happening in India right now related to access to vaccines, do you think? Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to join this panel and sharing with Heidi. Uh, yeah, yeah. today, you know, uh, people across India are grappling with the COVID-19 catastrophe with an exponential uh, increase in COVID-19 cases. Hospitals have run out of beds, basic medical supplies and medicines and oxygen. We witnessed that in Delhi, the capital city of India uh, 10 days ago, and it's still continuing. Even cremation grounds were overflowing a few days ago. So the crisis in oxygen supply, particularly the ICU beds and the hospitalization was much more than the vaccines, in fact. So uh, now the rural situation is worse. In fact, you know, it has been the surge in the numbers of number of patients in the villages, particularly in seven, eight states in our country is glaring. So with the kind of poor health infrastructure, the lockdown, which we have right now, and uh, it is really glaring. Uh, you know, this wave would have been anticipated and much more effective preparation could have been made from the evidence what we have experienced in many of the countries. Coming back to the question on the vaccines, you know, the low rate of vaccination um, is one aspect of the crisis uh, which we are currently facing. Uh, if, you, if you look at our own data, you know, we have only vaccinated meager 9.15% of the total population. And while the fully vaccinated population is only 2% as by me, Third, I can give that figure. So it has been planned in phases. First, it was open for the health workers, and then it was for 65 plus, and then above 45. And then now, on, from May 1st onwards, it has been eventually open for the young people from 18 years of age. When such decision of opening up the vaccination for varied age group was taken, 
one expects that a decision to have taken into consideration the number of doses necessary uh, to vaccinate such a large population in our country. So we have only two manufacturers, yeah, as you know, one is the Serum Institute of India and the other is Bharat Biotech. The Sputnik has just arrived, they declared that it will be given only July onwards. So there is a huge shortage. And the cost is also when you know the government procurement is also a big question for us now because the government is procuring uh you know there is a quota the ratio the 50 percent of supply is bought by the central government and distributed further and they're leaving the state governments to you know procure 25 percent on their own and 25 percent for the private sector even there is a variation in the cost i'm taking one minute more for this because the COVID shield is almost you know for the state government it is 5.48 us dollars uh, for the central it is approximately two us dollars and for the private sector, it is 8.22 US dollars. So uh, if you look at the Sputnik, it is you know much more. It is like a 5% uh, GST, that is a goods and service tax. And it is much more higher than what the other two, in fact. So affordability is also a big question, you know, because uh, as estimated, 35% of the families in India, they live below the poverty line. And there is a last issue is about the entire mechanism is the onus is on the citizens to get the, themselves vaccinated because they have to first register through a digital portal, which is COVID. And, you know, most of the people, they are non-literate and they may not have access to smartphones and laptops. So the equity issue comes in very much there. So there is an issue of procurement, affordability, accessibility, which is very much and along with the shortage. Thanks. Thank you for, yeah, just explaining a bit more about the situation. Um, so one of the things that's been talked about in this kind of issue of vaccine inequality is this term vaccine nationalism, um, which has been used to describe the behaviour of governments of rich countries who have hoarded vaccines um, and limited the stocks available for others, um, or what um, has also been described as, as the me first approach. Um, Heidi, what would you say to the argument that this is fair enough that governments should be protecting their own citizens and that's just what they're meant to be doing. I mean, we are in a global pandemic and uh, you can't really solve a glo global pandemic using nationalistic policies. And unfortunately, that's exactly what countries in the global north have done. Um, I actually saw a really good quote from the director general um, of the WHO, and he actually said that to, um, that to put out an inferno, you can't just hose one part um, of that inferno because the rest is raging on and that's exactly this nationalistic policy that we are seeing completely makes zero sense because actually the UK government is actually set to um, vaccinate most of that adult population in the UK by the end of this year but there's then, then leaving the vaccine to continue to um, transmit and to spread in unvaccinated parts of the world will only lead to more variants and more mutations that actually and potentially we could get a mutation that um, is going to be immune to our to uh, to to the vaccines that we have at the moment and render render them essentially okay. ineffective. Um, and so, actually, this um, this 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 nationalistic approach makes no sense um, from a public health perspective, and it also doesn't make sense from an economic perspective. The International Chamber of Commerce have said that the world is set to lose uh, around nine trillion dollars this year alone from um, not vaccinating the world um, in an equitable way. Um, and and a half of this is going to be borne by high income countries. So it's a completely self-defeating, short-sighted approach to dealing with the, the problem of um, vaccine access. Um, and actually, you know, I think you know, all governments do have the right to protect their own citizens. Um, and we would argue that should be something that all governments do, not, you know, not just, not just, uh, not just the, uh, high income countries. Um, and actually when, like I said last year, when the UK government were looking at vaccines, actually instead of looking at the, they knew they were gonna face the scarcity and instead of taking steps to unlock that production so there would be enough for the world, they decided to bury their heads in the sand, ignore the supply problem and just sort themselves out on a UK first basis. And this is the same approach that the EU and the US have taken as well. Um, and so when it comes to supplies, we have this small pie of doses and rich countries are grabbing a large slices of this pie. Um, and so we end up having conversations, for example, in the UK about um, should we be vaccinating um, 
you know, another 50 year old in this country or should we be that vaccinating uh, someone with existing conditions in Tanzania? And actually these conversations are about pitting off people against each other. Um, whereas actually what we need to do is actually increase the size of that pie um, and stop fighting over this small pie and say, actually, we need to end the pharmaceutical monopolies, which is keeping the pie small so that we can have a large pie so that there is enough slices for, for, for everybody that needs this vaccine. And actually, when the you know when when, when uh, early last year, the World Health the World Health Organization actually did come up with uh, an equitable allocation framework. And the idea behind that was that all countries should be able to vaccinate their vulnerable populations and their healthcare workers first. That, they, uh, that you should be able to vaccinate all of those first in every country before you start moving towards your um, other healthier demographics of your population. But the High income countries um, completely rejected that approach and instead, you know, like, like you said, went for the me first approach. Thank you. And, hi, and um, Sarajini, how does this kind of um, these arguments around vaccine nationalism play out in the country like India that's producing so many vaccines um, but is also exporting a lot of vaccines? Yeah, uh, I completely endorse what Heidi just now said about the global situation and global scenario. When it comes to India, I'm not too sure about uh, vaccine nationalism played out in India so much. In fact, government has initiated the vaccine Maitri program. Maitri means friendship, a vaccine friendship program. At exactly the same time when the domestic vaccination program began. Uh, without you know, properly estimating the urgency of vaccinating the whole population. Uh, under this uh, vaccine Maitri program, uh, India has exported more than 66 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines uh, um, in almost 95 countries. Well, but I'm not going into the details that, uh, that those details should be available. But while um, you know, a case must be made for vaccines for the immediate for example, here in the South Asian neighborhood, as a pandemic in any neighbor country will necessarily impact India. But the criticism is about assisting countries further, you know, uh, when they could have been used in India, you know, in light of increasing the shortage, uh, the government suspended the vaccine maitri program right now. The friendship program has been suspended. Uh, questions are now being raised whether the export done in the name of vaccine friendship was more a political statement than a planned policy decision. So the country, you know, does not even have adequate stock to vaccinate its own people right now. Thank you. Um, so one of the big things that um, campaigners are calling for is the suspension of patents um, and intellectual property enforcement for COVID-19 treatments and vaccines. Um, and a request for this led by India and South Africa was previously rejected by the US under Trump and by the UK and the EU and others. Um, Biden has recently said that he supports this um, and it's, the subject has kind of come up a bit more uh, about how hopeful are you both that this could be a turning point that things might change. Um, I'll go to you first, Heidi. Yeah, I'm, and I think um, it is definitely a turning point. Um, uh, this proposal was put on the table by South Africa and India um, back in October, and um, that's seven months ago. And in that seven months, that process has made absolutely zero progress because the high income countries have been um, essentially blocking the process and stalling the whole process and miring it in just question after question about whether IP is even a problem. Um, and uh, so because of that, um, it's, it's, it, the, the process at the WTO has been just dragged out over seven months. And in that seven months, I just think about kind of all the people that have died in that seven months. I think about um, what you, you know, the, the manufacturing um, scale up that you could have done in, in that sort of time. Um, and so it's been largely quite frustrating, certainly for the propo proponents of the proposal um, in the governments of India and South Africa, but also for the, um, the other supporters of the proposal. The, the proposal has support from uh, over 100 countries, largely from the global south. Um, and um, so, yeah, so, but, but since this um, Biden announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I think it's been a turning point because it's actually going to start unlocking this process. Um, it's going to give it a bit of a kickstart. Um, and 
country, the US is a big power broker in multilateral negotiations on, on whatever subject, just because of the, the power that they hold in global spaces. And the minute that they made this announcement, countries like Spain, New Zealand, Ireland, um, also said that they would support the proposal when previously they said they wouldn't. Um, and also, um, you know, the, the trading bloc, the EU, um, has now said that it will come to the negotiating table when Previously, it was um, preventing the process from entering into actual negotiations on the text itself. So I think that um, it is a, a significant moment. Um, it's going to help unlock the process and move the process one step forward when for so long it hasn't been able to take any step forward. Um, but there's still everything to play for. Um, the US decision is supporting a very narrow narrow version of the proposal. Um, so the proposal is a very broad proposal because it includes um, all health technologies. So that's COVID-19 vaccines, but also treatments, diagnostics, PPE, medical devices. Um, it needs basically covering all the health technologies needed to tackle COVID-19 and help us end this pandemic. Um, and it's also covering um, intellectual property rights um, across a wide range of intellectual property, which includes patents, which is the one we talk about more, so more often in public spaces, but it also includes other um, intellectual properties like things like copyright, industrial design and trade secrets. So it's a very broad proposal and, that, um, and actually the US um, announcement was a support for a, a, a waiver of the, of, of the patents on vaccines. So it's narrowed it right down to just those two things, whereas actually we're going to need the, what, the full range of health technologies if the world is going to um, have a hope of even bringing an end to this pandemic. Um, but I think that, um, you know, public mobilization and pressure is really important in this process. I think that because of the, um, the, the protests that we've organized, um, you know, we, we, as Global Justice Now, we work in collaboration with global allies um, as part of the Global People's Vaccine Alliance um, and to mobilize pressure in all the key countries that have been blocking this. Um, and when we heard that last month that Biden was considering um, changing his mind on this issue, uh, we mobilized a lot of pressure uh, with our US friends and allies to really um, ramp up the public pressure and the public scrutiny of Biden's decision. And so I think we're at a really crucial moment in terms of um, trying to um, move this process forward, trying to get the win on the broad proposal. Um, and I do think that public mobilization, activism, um, building public pressure are all going to be important parts of getting us hopefully over the line. Um, I, I had a, um, I had a, I, went in, I was in a briefing meeting a couple of weeks ago with the South African negotiator, and he actually said that the, you know, the public pressure you're creating um, in, on the outside gives us the ability to stand our ground inside the negotiating room. Thank you. And Sarjini, how, how optimistic are you about this? I, I uh, completely agree with Heidi. Uh, US has agreed to support the waiver, but uh, it appears that this support is limited to vaccines alone. Uh, the original proposal, as she said, it is asking for the IP waiver on all COVID related technologies. Uh, this could be a waiver on IP on not just vaccines, but also therapeutics technologies related to oxygen supply, PPEs and masks and you know, other things. So even as India, I'm talking from the Indian perspective, uh, it seeks patent waiver. Uh, we are refusing to allow more manufacturers to produce the vaccines, even on a licensing basis, despite the you know, intense shortage, which is quite paradoxical. Uh, what is the point of rallying at an international level when we ourselves are not sharing the technology and allowing our local manufacturing. Uh, we in fact have the major public sector units manufacturing vaccines historically, and then uh, most of the you know, vaccination uh, programs were supplied from these PSUs uh, for the child immunization through the universal immunization program. Our demand is why don't we share the technology and open, reopen and augment these PSUs. So IP waiver is only one aspect of production of any kind of technology. There is also sharing of uh, know-how and technology transfer. Uh, also, even if uh, large multinational pharmaceutical companies agree to transfer the technology uh, to any you know, low-income country or developing country manufacturer, they will need to redesign their supply chain, retrain their workforce, augment the facilities, and also the quality control. 
in a way, the waiver can be seen as a turning point, I agree, especially when it enables a possibility of countries coming together, trying to work together and responding to the pandemic. But there is still a huge amount of work to be done on supporting local production, on ensuring and exploiting the technology transfer and supporting all the healthcare workers. Thank you. And yeah, everyone remember, if you do have questions, then do put them in the Q&A or in the chat. And um, Joan, we have seen your question, um, so don't worry that we've missed it. Um, so the next the next thing I wanted to ask about was just kind of what's standing in the way. So we kind of talked a bit about this, I guess, but um, that I guess there's just some massive obstacles, including governments um, and um, Big Pharma um, when it comes to vaccine equality. Um, what would you say are the most important things that need to change? And I'll ask you first, Sarah Jeannie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the, for me, uh, Faraz actually, you know, who are here working on the people's, uh, from the people's health movement point of view, the framing of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's not only a public health, but it is also an economic crisis. And, uh, you know, that is where, you know, the, how the neoliberal state power in relation to the matter of crisis and the social disorder that that actually you know directly relates to the policy level so but still the government has the way with all and the power to one i i see here the revoke the patents if any on the vaccines definitely allow active tech transfer which i said earlier and prevent monopolistic practices of the pharma companies and revive the public sector undertaking to manufacture the vaccines for the public good uh, and supporting the existing public sector units, ensure that the vaccines are distributed in a fair and just manner. And also it's not just the vaccines alone, but the diagnostics, tests and treatments, they should be given free of charge to everyone everywhere. This is what we are asking for, you know, uh, uh, universal access to free vaccines. That is something which we are demanding here. And it has to be prioritized when there is a shortage. I'm not denying that frontline workers, vulnerable people, and they have to, and also for the poorer countries with the least capacity, that is something we need to understand. We need, it's not just in your own country, but even in other countries, they should be prioritized. And there, there needs to be, you know, you know uh, enough uh, infrastructure and financial resources to improve the health infrastructure. Of course, you know, utilize the TRIPS flexibilities to allow import of COVID vaccines by issuing compulsory license, particularly in India, uh, not rely on the digital system to register for vaccines, which we are looking at it in our country right now. So if uh, these are the things I feel, you know, should be uh, uh, in, looked into if you want any change. Thank you. And um, the final question that I had was around what people can do. So it's such a, I guess, a quite a big topic, but if people are watching this um, and they want to do something to change things, but they maybe feel like it's beyond their control, uh, what would you recommend that people can do to try and increase access to vaccines and, and, and address this pandemic? Um, Heidi, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I guess uh, as a campaigner, working for a campaigning organisation, I guess my first response would be to um, join a campaign. Um, I, um, uh, at Global Justice Now, we are based in the UK and we have been fighting for access to medicines for a number of years, even you know, before the pandemic, because actually this is a long standing issue. We, we should, we should, you know, we've, I've talked about pharmaceutical monopolies being a problem right now, but actually they've long been a problem. Um, this is a system that was completely stitched up by the industry over 25 years ago, where they wrote the rules for themselves to benefit, um, you know, to create the, the kind of climate that they need to um, become one of the most profitable industries in the world. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so uh, this is a, a long term fight, uh, but the the pandemic has kind of crystallized the issue and has created actually an opportunity to question why do we even have this um, profit-driven um, innovation system that is 
that is orientated around profiteering rather than public health. Um, so I think this is a really good opportunity to build that movement, to get people on board, to find out a bit more. Um, I'll also plug your magazine. Um, like I think new, the, the, the current issue of New Internationalist is a really good place to start to kind of find out a bit more, to understand some of these is issues. Because certainly when I speak in public spaces about this topic, um, I often get questions about um, which indicate to me that the public, certainly in the UK, are actually seeing the pharmaceutical industry as a bit of a, uh, you know, a saviour for, for this pandemic. You know, in, in the UK context, um, people often say, have you had the jab yet? Is it AstraZeneca? Is it, vac is it Pfizer? And actually, they're feeling quite grateful to get their vaccine and they're feeling grateful to the companies. And so even though we as kind of campaigners are working on this and we understand the issues, I think the general awareness around these issues isn't as high. And so that's why I do encourage you, like I said, to find out more, read up about it. New Internationalist has got a latest edition all about this subject. Um, and also to yeah, connect with campaigning organisations who are working on this. The movement around this issue has grown so big. I mean, um, I'm sure you know, Sarah Jean has been in the movement herself for a long time, actually. But for a lot of years, you know, we were plugging away at this when no one cared. Um, and it was really hard to get traction in the outside world. And then over the last year or so, I've, you know, I've seen all the big NGOs come back into this space, like Oxfam and Amnesty, uh, you know, Avaz. Uh, so there are lots of different groups coming together to, to, to fight for this um, the IP waiver. Um, I think it's a really important fight because it's the first time, like I said, in 25 years that we've been able to even put a dent um, on this global trade agreement that should never have even been written. You know, it should, it, it, it was, once it was put into place, it was then seen as a law of nature, something completely untouchable. And now there's a real opportunity where, where we are casting doubt um, on a system that prioritizes monopolies and profits above people's health. Um, so, yeah, and then um, I was also going to suggest that we also currently have a petition up on our website targeting governments um, and pharmaceutical corporations to support both um, the, the IP waiver, but also the intellectual property waiver at the WTO, but also to support um, uh, efforts by the World Health Organization to facilitate technology transfer and the sharing of know-how, which are both will be needed for production. Um, so yeah, so just some of my ideas on, 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 how, on, on what to do next. Thank you. Um, Sarah Jeannie, what do you think we should all be doing to try and, yeah, change things? See, we are all aware that the you know, barriers and threats to equitable access are, are diverse and complex. Uh, they are structured by the, as I said earlier, political and economical institutional systems within which healthcare technologies are developed, produced, distributed, and utilized. So, uh, but now the pandemic has actually exposed the deep fractures in societies and communities, uh, and also within the system that we must reckon with. It's a, uh, for me, it's a moment that is challenging us to create urgent and systemic change. Uh, also the crisis is not particular to one nation, one country, it is a global one. All across the globe, every country followed similar paths for the prevention, uh, therapeutic care and vaccination. However, the questions uh, remain around how transparent, how responsive and how collective were these global responses? Did they operate in the spirit of uh, internationalism uh, or were agendas laid down by the powerful nation states? Uh, we also need to learn from our own local experiences. I think it is very important the multiple stories of uh, successes and failures in providing access to care for all human beings. For example, in each of our countries, uh, people from the marginalized sections, whether they are the refugees, migrant workers, or you know, marginalized by gender and sexuality, women, young people, or racial and caste and ethnic groups, uh, women living in the prisons or disabled, uh, whoever, you know, people living with disability, getting equal access to testing, uh, medicines, care, food, is a vaccine for COVID-19 being allocated equitably or are there restrictions of different kinds? What are the criteria being applied in determining who will have the access to the vaccine? I'm talking internationally too. Uh, but at the civil society level, as a part of the people's health movement, I think we need to ask critical questions, extend sustained solidarities across the movements uh, to resist, to challenge, to transform, 
and to emphasize on the redistributive justice and accountability. Struggles are not new, but the pandemic poses another critical moment to reinforce, to forge ahead, uh, like the IP waiver. You know. And PHM, as a part of the People's uh, Vaccine Campaign, we have come up with many statements and you can access them on our website too. Yeah, these are some of the things I put. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, can you just remind us of your website URL and then we'll post a, a link in the chat. Or we can do, yeah. You're on mute, I don't know if you're speaking, sorry. Um, so we're gonna move on to the questions now. Um, and we've got a few that have come in already. Um, and uh, my colleague has kind of been sorting through them for me. Um, so the first one I wanna ask is about uh, Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation. Um, could the panel say something about the, the questionable role played by the Gates Foundation? That's a question from Joan. Um, um, Either of you, I'm welcome to take that one on. Yeah, I think um, Gates, where do I start? Um, but yeah, Gates is a, uh, has a really scary amount of influence in global health spaces. Uh, he's, he has essentially fought his way, fought his way into the very highest uh, levels of decision making um, in places like uh, World Health Organization, um, Gavi, which is now running COVAX, uh, the vaccine procurement scheme for the world. Um, and uh, yeah, and his, essentially his influence is completely unaccountable. Um, he is the um, second largest funder of the World Health Organization and had the Trump um, withdrawn from the World Health Organization, he would have become the, uh, the biggest funder of the World Health Organization. He also funds a lot of um, health-based NGOs as well. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, it's very difficult for a lot of other organizations to criticize his role. And essentially, in addition to his um, influence and power being hugely unaccountable, he also represents corporate interests in the spaces that he occupies and in the places where he has influence. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I actually think that the, you know, the role of Gates is really problematic um, generally in global, in, around global health policy, uh, but even more so during this pandemic. Um, Sarajini, do you want to add anything on Gates before we move on? Uh, I think Heidi uh, said very clearly uh, exactly that is what we all feel here. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just want to go back to the the trajectory, like in 2009-8, in fact, uh, there was a huge controversy on the human papillomavirus vaccines in India, uh, which was actually conducted by PATH and uh, supported by BMGF. At that point of time, there were many questions which came up on this, the, you know, the foundation supporting you know, and not taking any accountability and not making anything transparent. And those questions will still stay. Uh, even in today's context, uh, uh, that's, that's Thanks. So um, we've had a question come in around misinformation. Um, uh, they're saying, I would be interested to hear the panel's panelists' view on misinformation around COVID-19 vaccines and its impact worldwide, um, things like on social media and conspiracy theories and that kind of thing. Um, Sarajini, do you have any thoughts on that to start with? Yeah, you know, uh, the question here we have raised is on the uh, entire uh, the clinical trial processes, how transparent the information was placed on the public domain. You know, where are the reports which came from the, you know, the studies or the trials uh, which were conducted, that was not on the public domain. That raised, you know, a lot of concerns and then what will happen if a trial participant has any adverse event following you know immunization later or uh, during the trial process if there is any serious adverse event happens who will be responsible you know what we wanted is the data to be transparent data should be put it up put placed on the public domain and uh, i don't think there is any uh, you know uh, such uh, hesitation should be with the pharmaceutical companies to place their uh, data on the clinical trials on the public domain why can't they do that even now 
there are concerns which were raised, you know, on the AEFI, that is adverse event following immunization. Like there were multiple uh, experiences coming, like even after taking two doses, people are having, after, after taking one dose, people are having COVID, getting COVID infection. So those doubts can be cleared then once the data is in the public domain. So I don't think people are anti-vaccine. And people are actually asking critical questions about the transparency and accountability. If you say anything, in fact, uh, I mean, I told last time also, if you say anything about the vaccines, you are immediately labeled in that binary kind of thing, you are pro or anti. No, we are not anti-vaccine. In fact, I had my two shots of vaccine, in fact. So it's not like one is, one is asking questions about the accountability and transparency and the data particularly. Thank you. Um, Heidi, do you have any thoughts on that one? You're on mute. Sorry, yeah. No, I, I, no, I completely agree that I think one way to counter misinformation and, um, and fears as well is, is through um, ensuring there's more um, transparency um, around um, around the data around the data and so, so for example the um, AstraZeneca vaccine when it was um, approved last year actually it took quite a while for the public um, for the information around the um, peer-reviewed data to be put in the public domain and actually there was a series of vaccine approvals which were um, so a series of vaccine announcements sorry uh, around successful trials which were announced through press release rather than through actually publicized, you know, pu publishing in full um, the full um, vaccine results so that people, um, experts, scientists and so on could actually scrutinize, um, scrutinize that. So I think, and I think that for me kind of echoes quite a lot of the secrecy generally around Big Pharma. Um, there's a lot of secrecy around kind of their, their, their costs, their prices, the deals that they do, um, the, the manufacturing costs and things like that. Um, and so I, I think the way to um, improve kind of trust in um, in, the, in the final products is to ensure that there is transparency around all these different aspects of these vaccines. Thank you. Um, so we've had some questions, a couple of questions come in around the, the different vaccine producers. Um, Vanessa's asking, are all va vaccine producers as bad as each other in resisting the IP waiver, for example? Um, what about the Chinese, Russian, and uh, maybe an imminent Cuban, Cuban vaccine maker? Um, and um, somebody else asked a similar question about the role of, that China and Russia have played on the IP issue um, in relation to vaccines. Um, Heidi, uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, yeah, so, so essentially all the vaccine makers at the moment are um, probably, you know, will, will have intellectual property over their vaccines and there's also intellectual property around the components and around sort of the materials needed to make the vaccines and the processes. So actually there's patents throughout the whole system and actually that's one of the big, that's one of the um, uh, benefits of the IP, the IP waiver proposal is that it would clear away um, these what are called patent thickets, these kind of um, layers and layers of patents on a single product. Um, but yeah, so, so a lot of these products, a lot of these vaccine products and the, the components to make them will be covered in IP, um, intellectual property, um, and, uh, and actually and the, the, the Chinese and the Russian vaccines also have intellectual property on them. Probably the big difference between the Western and the Chinese and Russian vaccines are that um, the Chinese and Russian va vaccines, um, if you look at their distribution, a graph of their distribution, you will see that they, they have been supplying to countries in the global south, whereas the northern vaccines have largely been for um, global north countries. Having said that, the um, Chinese and Russian vaccines um, are charging quite a high price, so they're sort of around the sort of $20 mark, which is, a, which is really expensive for, for a vaccine. Um, and so actually our demands for the waiver of IP, there are demands for te sharing technology, uh, sharing know-how and ramping up production actually applies to all these vaccine makers. Um, it'll be interesting to see what Cuba does. There's been kind of whispers that potentially Cuba might join, might 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 be up for more openly sharing their technology and their know-how, but we, we, we'll have to wait to see how that um, ends up. Thank you. Um, Sarajini, do you want to add anything on this before we move on? Okay. So um, there's a question from Nigel, uh, to what extent does the global response to COVID-19 provide a template for a wider reform of access to good health? And how much does that wider impact create a barrier to change? Um, and then in brackets, they write, um, thin end of the wedge fears from existing holders of power in the market. 
Um, I don't know, uh, Sajin, if, if you have thoughts on this um, to start with. I think that's Heidi to respond to this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think um, I think it's a really exciting moment as an Access to Medicines campaigner. Um, these moments don't come along very often because we're now questioning the actual underlying model um, that delivers us medicines more generally. Um, I think that we could... Um, if we if we had successes around the intellectual property waiver, around um, the te- sharing of technology and know-how, using through going through the World Health Organization, basically opening up um, all the um, resources for innovation, um, then potentially we could actually really fundamentally change the landscape around manufacturing and production. Because at the moment, like I said, a lot of these production facilities are in the global north, which is why they were able, rich countries were able to secure vaccine, vaccine doses in advance because they had um, the production facilities in their own countries um, and they were able to grab the doses first. Um, and there isn't, you know, there, I think that we, when we're thinking about these issues, I think if we did get the, the IP waiver, the intellectual property waiver and technology transfer through the World Health Organization, then you would actually completely change the business model um, for how you produce medicines. Um, and we're also pushing for public funding, public investment to go into um, developing local and regional manufacturing in the global south. Um, and actually, when you combine all of those three elements together, um, and you also, and, and the public investment for manufacturing global south is controlled by governments rather than by the by, by market logic. You could actually designate things like vaccines to be global public goods. So the, the um, items, the health tools that are designated that are so important that they are produced by the public sector. And uh, like Sarah Gina was saying earlier, given for free to the people who need them, um, rather than being driven by market logic and being and 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 being and selling to the highest bidders for the highest price and and completely um, ignoring uh, the needs of people in the global south, um, I think that could be a really interesting vision for us to kind of work towards um, because for, for too long the pharmaceutical industry has had a complete control over the whole system. Um, and it's been virtually unshakable. We've had little um, victories here and there where, where countries have been able to override patents using compulsory licensing. But to actually question the whole system um, is a really important um, point, I think, in, in, um, at the moment that we're facing in terms of, a, in terms of the wider uh, global movement around access to medicines. Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually, I just had a quick follow on for you, Heidi, from I think it was something that you said earlier. Joe is asking, are you saying that Gates is a bigger investor in the WHO than any country? I don't know if that was. Yeah, he, he, he's second highest funder. He's a second highest. Uh, yeah, second biggest funder, sorry, of the World Health Organization. The first is the US, then it's Gates. I think the third might be UK, I think as a single country funder, or it could be the EU as a, as a, as a trading bloc. But yeah, he does rank up there with the countries. Um, in terms of funding contribution. Thank you. Um, so we've got a question from Richard. Um, trips, um, patents and IP waivers should be the easy part. It happened in the past and 90% of the R&D costs, so the research and development costs for vaccine development was paid by governments. What about sharing manufacturing capacity, training and staff, supply chain uh, across the world, global north to south, these re- vaccines, but also for f- future health crisis. Um, and how, how do you see something like that being achieved? Who yeah. do you have? Okay, yeah, no, I think it's a really good point, really good point in the question, um, because we are facing a supply problem right now definitely, but with the, but this supply problem isn't going to go away. You know, it looks like we might need booster jabs um, and rich countries are starting talking about vaccinating children. Um, and so actually the demand for jabs are going to, going to be here for a while. We're going to potentially need them not just this year, but potentially year after year, especially like I said, if you need booster jabs to maintain immunity. Um, and so we do need to think about our response to the global pandemic right now, but we also need to um, prepare for the next pandemic. Um, a lot of health experts are predicting that these we, 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 we are going to pandemics are going to become a bit of a, a phenomenon in terms of um, uh, global health needs uh, in the coming years. Um, and yes, yeah, so, so in terms of manufacturing capability and how we would see that kind of being 
um, bolstered during this time is, um, I mentioned the World Health Organization has come up with a couple of initiatives to help facilitate that. And I think it, it needs to be facilitated through something like the World Health Organization rather than done on a bilateral basis, because when you have technology terms on a bilateral basis, that's where the corporations get to maintain their control. So for example, AstraZeneca and Serum Institute, that is a, a, a voluntary te technology transfer um, the voluntary license, um, but ultimately AstraZeneca maintains control. Serum just becomes part of their monopoly, in essence. Um, and so that's why we need to break open um, the sharing of know-how, not just between one, com one big pharmaceutical industry or company that controls it to another manufacturer, but to actually do it through the World Health Organization. So they've set up a couple of initiatives. One is the COVID-19 technology access pool, and the other is technology transfer hubs. But both of these initiatives, the idea being that you bring um, a technology, the technology, the know-how, the blueprints into uh, an open space um, that can then be accessed by um, whichever company or government or manufacturer or factory wants to make those particular health tools. Um, and so I think in addition to, you know, we talked a lot about the intellectual property waiver this evening, we need to continue to push for that and use that moment that Biden's created for us to continue to push for it. But at the same time, we also need to continue to put pressure on pharmaceutical companies to be part of the WHO schemes because they do rely on um, pharmaceutical companies to actually cooperate because um, they're, um, having said that, I do think that we need to push our governments as well to find ways to mandate companies to join these initiatives because um, like part of the question said, a lot of these vaccines have been publicly funded. Um, they should be the people's vaccines already, um, openly licensed, openly manufactured, ramping up supplies for as many to, to ensure we get the kind of doses that we need um, to ensure we can meet global demand. Thanks, I'm sorry. Just add one point here, just adding to you know, what Harry was saying, I'm just trying to reflect our own context. Uh, uh, you know, for example, um, we have actually, the government has, uh, you know, uh, in fact, contributed paid for the trial sites for the pharmaceutical companies to, you know, manufacture for the trial during the trial period. And uh, it's something which we have to remember, like, you know, it should be, it should not be forgotten that all the leading vaccine developers, uh, they have benefited from, you know, billions of dollars in public subsidy, with the public subsidies, in fact. Uh, yet pharma corporations, you know, they have been, uh, they have been handed over the monopoly uh, rights. Uh, to produce and profit from the vaccine. So this is something which we are also arguing here, like, you know, Bharat Biotech is actually, a uh, government has supported quite a bit. In fact, it is a locally manufactured vaccine. And then why do we need to pay? Uh, it should be available free of cost. In fact, it is uh, expensive than the serums AstraZeneca, uh, SII's so, uh, COVID shield, which we call it here, COVID shield. So, but that is something, you know, which we need to ask. And then uh, one, I think, you know, there are multiple ways of addressing. One is definitely at the international level, what we are doing right now. And then exactly what you said, the turning point with the IP waivers. And then now, even at the country level, you know, uh, what I said, even though we argued there along with South Africa on the patents, but here when it comes to the compulsory licensing, we are not, uh, you know, allowing that. So uh, that itself is a big question. So in that context, we feel uh, even at the country level, we need to, you know, uh, campaign, uh, not, not only at the global level, you need to also think at your own country level, what strategies will work? Uh, how do you, you know, move on this issue to make sure that, you know, the tech transfer and the local augmentation, local manufacturing, at least in India, it, it was actually, it is in fact, to some extent pharmacy of the world, it has been called at one point of time, uh, we were biggest manufacturers of the vaccine. But my concern is what about the other countries, you know, which may not have that kind of know-how or, you know, the other kind of uh, manufacturing capacities. So how are we going to support them? Uh, at global level, you know, for example, whether it is in Africa, whether it is in South Asia, for example, in Nepal and other countries, how do we make sure like they will have such capacity? I think that is the biggest challenge. If you are thinking of the third wave or the next pandemic, then this has to be also thought through how equitable 
uh, we will be in the context of uh, vaccines and other drugs uh, when it comes to the you know poorer nations yeah thanks yeah and um... We're, we're almost out of time. I'm going to try and squeeze in just one more question. Um, and it's about that Cuba vaccine that was mentioned. Um, Rich is asking, would it take just one vaccine manufacturer to waive IP to bring the whole big pharma model tumbling down? Um, what do you think about that question? Like, would it take just one company to change the way they do things for everyone to follow suit? Or do you think it needs to be more, more than that? Um, I think that one company would be a big win from where we're starting from. So our starting point is complete and utter control and domination by Big Pharma. So anything that chips away at that control and domination, um, even if it's just one company using an open licensing model, um, I think for me is progress. It's probably not a complete answer, but it's moving forward from where we are right now. Um, and I think that, you know, as you create these different alternatives, it, 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 it opens up the space for um, more radical um, um, and uh, more people focused solutions and the sorts of things that we need and want. Thank you. Um, and actually, Sajini, I just wondered if you had any just very brief thoughts on Nigel's question in the chat, which is, it's arguable, arguable that good health is linked to food and water and education more than medical intervention. So should we build an integrated response rather than focus on more specialized interventions? Yeah, we you know, uh, look at health and healthcare, both need to be addressed. When we say health, health includes social determinants, uh, which we are all familiar with. It can be you know, including food, water, sanitation, and free from violence, and many, 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 you know, determinants are there, like it is expanding, you know, the, uh, the social determinants, commercial determinants, the legal determinants, you know, the definitions for the determinants is expanding. Um, so this is very, very important for us, like, you know, that's what I said in the beginning, we need to look from both, from the, uh, uh, when we are looking at the technology, it has to be located in the context of uh, economic and uh, political environments, definitely. You know, that will make it like, even if, for example, the Delhi context, it was lack of oxygen and ICU beds at one point of time, two weeks ago, and lack of medicines. And in other places, it is hunger and malnutrition, aggravated the, you know, the, uh, the you know, infection, infection rate to some extent, and then the immunity levels were coming down. So these are all interlinked. I cannot see everything independently in silos. Uh, so we have to address, definitely we have to talk about healthcare, healthcare technologies and health determinants both together. So then only we will address the issue in totality. Thank you. Um, so before we finish, do either of you have anything you want to say? Um, and then um, we'll hand back to Dunya. Don't feel that you have to. <laughs> Just wanted to give you the chance. Okay, well, yeah, thank you both so much um, for, for coming today. And um, especially to you, Sarjini, it's so late and there's so much going on for you. But we really, really appreciate you, you joining us today. Um, and yeah, um, there's some, a nice comment there from Doug in the chat. Um, I'm going to hand back to Dinya in just a second, but um, yeah, just wanted to say thank you again. And um, yeah, it's been really great speaking to you. Okay. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks so much. So much. And uh, I hope the situation will change soon. And then we all will have vaccinations free for everyone across the globe. Uh, it's not just in one particular country. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's, okay. that's definitely a fervent wish. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, who's joined us today from all, all, all parts, really, from Windhoek and from Portugal, uh, of course, from Oxford, where New Internationalist has its office, from Bremen in Germany, Halifax in Canada, Norfolk, Manchester, and of course, the Londoners. Uh, and thank you also to Sarojini and Heidi for taking part and offering us their amazing insights. Uh, we really appreciate you giving up your time for this. Please do look into the work of Global Justice Now and SAMA. There are links in the chat. 
And you can find out more about New Internationalist at newint.org. And if you're interested in joining us as a co-owner, then we have a community share offer open until the 1st of June. The money raised will help us to address the impacts of this pandemic on our work and make sure we can keep our independent magazine running and covering stories like this for years to come. So head to saveourstories.info to find out more about that. Now we're going to leave the chat open for another couple of minutes before ending the webinar just so you can take down any details that are there. You can do that by clicking on the three little dots at the bottom of the chat next to where it says file, and then you can click to save the chat. So once more, my heartfelt thanks for all of you for coming, and I hope we'll see you again soon. Thank you.